Hey folks, welcome back to Leader Talk. I'm SEAC retired John Wayne Troxel. Hey, today it's going to be a quick episode and I just want to talk about some current events that are going on in our nation, kind of give me my thoughts on them and what kind of impact I think stuff like this will have on our nation and the world. The first thing I want to talk about tonight is finally the U.S. forces along with the U.K., did a retaliatory strike against the Houthi rebels in the Red Sea. Finally, thank you. Finally. Yes, just recently, our forces along with UK and other nations, partner nations, uh, hit more than a dozen sites of the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Now, I've been to Yemen before when I was the SEAC, I made that trip down to Djibouti City, Djibouti, Camp Lamagne there, and made my way across the Bab al-Mandeb Strait in a special operations helicopter and spent some time over there in Yemen. And I can tell you that it's a shithole and that there's nothing but a lot of bad guys there, now, not just the Houthi rebels, but Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So this was a good strike to get after the Houthis because they are a proxy group for Iran. And some of the targets we hit with our warships, our submarines, and our fighter jets were some air defense and coastal radar sites, drone and missile storage, and uh, launching locations as well. And as if you've been paying attention to what's been going on in the Red Sea, the Houthis have done numerous attacks on shipping vessels as well as uh, military uh, vessels as well to kind of get after their disdain for what Israel is doing in uh, Gaza against Hamas. So this is a step in the right direction in terms of showing U.S. and coalition resolve and showing Iran and its proxies that we're not going to put up with any crap when it comes to them. President Biden even says he's not going to tolerate ceaseless attacks on merchant vessels in the Red Sea and things like this. And it's kind of ironic that he said that because under President Trump, we listed the Houthis as a global terrorist organization. The minute President Biden came into power, he removed that label from the Houthis. So it's kind of ironic that he would remove that label from a terrorist organization like the Houthis and then come back with a, the kind of attack that we did here. But God bless him that we did the attack God bless our forces that participated in it, in pushing back against this radical organization that uh, it truly does not care about human life. So we'll see what happens in the future here. Obviously, the Houthis aren't going away. The Iranian proxies, the other ones, Hezbollah, Hamas, and these others aren't going to go away, especially with the war in Israel. And obviously, the Shia militia groups that are uh, conducting the attacks on our forces and Syria and Iraq aren't going to go away either. But I applaud the Biden administration because this is a start on how to push back against radical terrorists that are trying to not only disrupt what's going on with world travel, but cause just unnecessary casualties on innocent people. Good on us, good on our coalition forces. So let's take a quick break and let's hear from our sponsors at Downrange Supplements. Downrange Supplements. As the brand of the troops, we produce only the highest quality supplements conducive to mission effectiveness. Whether it's our fully dosed pre-workout, recovery and rehydration, or Mermite protein, it's time to continually improve your fighting position with Downrange Supplements. Go to www.downrangesupps.com today and take your training to the next level. Hey folks, welcome back to Leader Talk. I'm John Wayne Troxell, former senior enlisted advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, now retired. Hey, the next story I want to talk to you about was kind of interesting, but kind of weird, very unusual. So someone that I highly respect, someone that I served with in combat, I served under his leadership in the 82nd Airborne Division in the late 90s, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, uh, all of a sudden was gone for four days. And I say gone, uh, he was in the hospital receiving treatment for a medical condition. 
But what a lot of people didn't know about is his whereabouts was unknown by the White House. It was unknown to the president and the White House that he was in the hospital for four days. Even top deputies in the office of the Secretary of Defense allegedly did not know where the secretary was or that he was in the hospital, which I find very unusual. Now, the National Command Authority consists of the president and the secretary of defense. All right, so all orders from the president to our forces go from the president through the secretary of defense, by the secretary of defense, down to our combatant commands for battle orders or for executing missions. Much like this event that I talked about in the first segment, on the Houthi rebels in the Red Sea, where the president made the decision, it went down through the Secretary of Defense, and it went to U.S. Central Command, responsible for the Middle East, who executed the mission. Why it's a problem when the Secretary of Defense is not available, then some sources are saying that the Deputy Secretary of Defense was in charge, but she happened to be on vacation in Puerto Rico. Why that's a problem is, is if the president can't get hold of the Secretary of Defense, and folks don't know how to get a hold of the Secretary of Defense within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and something has to be made in a timely manner in terms of an action to protect the United States or its interests, this is a problem. The normal process for the absence of the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, two men that I worked for when I was the senior enlisted guy in the DOD, at the time being Jim Mattis and Joe Dunford, it is a rigorous discipline process when they go on leave or when they are absent. I mean, it is so formal that from the minute and, and hour and day that they are absent until they absolutely return, there is a formal order that goes out letting people know that the Secretary of Defense is on leave or whatever, the Deputy Secretary of Defense is in charge now or is assuming the duties. The same with the chairman. The other thing that's interesting about this whole event is that the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, their positions are guided so that they can't even do things like fly on commercial aircraft. If they go on leave and they're going to fly somewhere, they have to take military aircraft. Now, they pay fair market value for them and their family to fly when they're on leave and everything, but they can't take civilian aircraft, uh, commercial aircraft anywhere. The other thing is they always have security with them, always. Whenever there's a movement of the Secretary of Defense or the Chairman, they have a two or a three vehicle convoy with them, moving them around. So it's, it's kind of weird to me that not a lot of folks knew where the Secretary was or what was going on with him. Now, my assumption is people knew what was going on and knew where he was at, but somehow that word didn't get across the river and to the White House and to the president. Now, hey, I know Secretary Austin very well. He's an old paratrooper like me, an old war horse like me. And I know he, he didn't want people knowing what's going on with him with his medical condition because he didn't want people to have to worry about him and what he's doing, okay? And certainly there is no legislature or any guidelines that say that an official like the Secretary of Defense has to disclose their medical condition. But common sense will tell you that when it comes to being able to execute orders from the president to our military forces to do something to protect our nation, that we cannot have this void where, you know, the whereabouts of the senior defense official aren't known by the White House. The bottom line is I love Secretary Austin served with him multiple times. I hope that he gets well soon and he's back into action. We need his leadership. But what this has caused, there's been some transparency through the White House, through the National Security Advisor spokesman, that they are going to look at and review procedures on when something like this happens. And certainly OSD is doing an internal look. The Inspector General is, has opened an investigation and everything. But the bottom line is, we want Secretary Austin healthy. We want him safe for his family and everything. But more importantly, we cannot have this kind of breakdown in communication between the president and the Secretary of Defense, because as the National Command Authority, they execute all orders 
that get after protecting our nation and getting after any threat to the homeland. Okay, we're going to take another quick break to hear from our sponsors at Downrange Supplements, and we'll come back with the final segment and give our warrior shout out right after this. How you guys doing? I'm Colton Smith, and I'm announcing right now, Downrange Supplements is in your local commissary. If you're anywhere near a base and you have base access, get to the commissary and check out our pre-workout, our rehydration BCA formula, and our protein. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. It is the best in the market. And List and Nine Fight Company, my brand, is partnered with Downrange Supplements for a reason. And I tell you, their products work. And also, don't forget, we kill suckers. Hey folks, welcome back to the final segment of this edition of Leader Talk. I'm SEAC retired John Wayne Trox. Hey, in this uh, segment, uh, I'm titling Why Come Suit, meaning you can't make this shit up, all right? And this Why Come Suit here is about the nation of South Africa. This week, South Africa formally accused Israel of committing genocide against the Palestinians and accusing them that they've been doing it for years. And uh, they pleaded with the International Court of Justice at the United Nations to order an immediate halt to the Israeli offensive in Gaza. Now, in previous episodes, I talked about the Israeli focus on Hamas in Gaza and how their targeted operations are kind of how we did business in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And unfortunately, when somebody like Hamas gets a vote in terms of what happens to innocent Palestinians and innocent Palestinians don't heed tactical call outs or orders to leave, that unfortunately, uh, civilian casualties as collateral damage happens. But to hear South Africa kind of formally accuse Israel of committing genocide is rich, rich in itself, okay? Because South Africa as a nation, apartheid was going on for years where there was the persecution and in some call genocide of black South Africans. But now when you look at what's happening in the country now, just recently there's a politician there by the name of Julius Malena. And he continues to chant, you know, he's hoping in 2024 to get elected you know, in a high position in the South African government. But he uses this song called Kill the Boar Song. And it was a song that initially was used by South Africa during the apartheid years to push back on that apartheid and discrimination. But now that song continues to get chanted now. And by this very influential politician who chants it all the time. And basically what it's talking about or what he is focusing on is killing the whites. And basically he's been calling for a white genocide. Some say, oh no, that's not what he's doing. He's just honoring this song that for years, uh, black South Africans would sing during apartheid years and everything. But what you have seen lately in South Africa is the slaughtering of farmers, formerly known as boars, uh, as they are known in Kill the Boar song. And it's not just white farmers, but it's been black farmers too that are targeted. And the bottom line is South Africa has a horrible history in human rights as well as genocide and everything. To the point that even Democratic Senator John Fetterman said this week, maybe South Africa ought to sit this one out, okay, because of their past and their history. And then the other thing, there's, there's nations that are rallying around this South African cry. And some of those nations are like Turkey, who is a NATO uh, member, you know, and kind of an ally of the United States. But I will tell you, in my four years in the Pentagon as the SEAC, there were multiple incidences of Turkey that was trying to splinter NATO. 
and splintering NATO and means by trying to buddy up with the Russians and potentially trying to buy weapons from the Russians to include radars and everything like that. And were it not for my bosses and for our action, along with our NATO partners, they probably would have done some stuff like that. So I don't give a lot of credit to South Africa having allies when they talk about Turkey. The other one is Venezuela. Okay, don't get me started on Venezuela and, you know, the socialist kind of atmosphere in that country and some of the just screwed up shit that goes on in that nation down there and has gone on in that nation down there. The other one's Pakistan, who doesn't have a great human rights record. Colombia, who had five decades of a civil war going on. And then other countries there. The bottom line is all of these countries aren't doing this with South Africa because it's the right thing to do. They're doing it because they hate Israel and they want to bring the nation of Israel down. And Israel happens to be a strong ally of the United States of America. And that is another reason why these countries and why South Africa wants to get after this and formally accuse Israel of genocide. Hey, I don't know what's going to happen in the future here. And nobody wants to see no war around the world bigger than me, okay? Even a guy that spent 38 years serving in uniform and five years in war, I don't want to see young men and women having to go off to war. I don't want to see innocent civilians getting killed and everything. But I know the world we live in, and it can be a shitty place, and there are some insidious actors out there that will continue to get after things. And the more nations like South Africa needing to do a self-reflection, you know, of themselves before they start spewing accusations, you know, the more we have nations doing stuff like that, the more we will continue to have conflict out there. So South Africa, in the words of Senator Fetterman, maybe you want to set this one out, okay? Now, let's get to our warrior shout out. Today, a, a great American, a great soldier, a great officer, a great leader signed out on terminal leave from the United States Army and retired from active duty after closing in on 30 years of service. And my warrior shout out today goes to a great warrior, a great leader, and a great personal friend of mine, Colonel John Chung. Colonel Chung led at all levels as an airborne ranger and as a commander in light infantry units. He's got extensive combat experience and is one of the most charismatic and influential leaders I've ever seen and I've ever served with. I first met him 12 years ago in Afghanistan, and over the past few years, I spent a lot of time with him. What you may not know about Colonel John Chung, he has been the target of scrutiny across his career. And as of late, uh, in his last two brigade level commands to the point that in his last job, uh, the complaints were enough that he was relieved of his command. But anyways, John Chung retired today uh, with honor and stay tuned on a future episode because John Chung will be a guest on my show and we're going to allow him to tell his story of this whole process of him being under investigation not once, not twice, but nine times because he was a dynamic leader, because he was a leader that did not put up with BS, and he was a leader that expected people to strive for excellence. So stay tuned for that in future episodes. But my warrior shout out today goes to a great Airborne Ranger, Colonel John Chung. Thank you, sir. I salute you. Now, if you like what you see here today, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. You can also follow us on our website at pmehard.com. Don't forget, you can pick up my memoir, my book, Surrender or Die, Reflections of a Combat Leader, on Amazon or on our website, pmehard.com. And follow us on eTool Nation on our Facebook page. And uh, stay tuned again for our next episode coming up here on Leader Talk. Until then, God bless you all. God bless America. And God bless the men and women that serve in the greatest military in the world. Boom.